In the early stages of the Egghead arc, a perceptive man made this remark. Are they really going to eliminate the most useful man in the world? Is this somehow connected to the recent incident in Lulucia? At first glance, Vegapunk's assassination and the disappearance of the kingdom of Lulucia seemed unrelated. However, it's clear that the sinking of the world began with the disappearance of Lulucia, and Vegapunk is trying to spread the truth about this. Ultimately, Lucci's hunch was right on target. Last year, I speculated from a native Japanese perspective in this video that Lily's letter mentioned a sinking world, and it might have turned out to be accurate. This theory has been gradually gaining traction since chapter 1113 was released. It seems that friends in the community have helped spread it. Thank you so much. By adding the latest information to content from about eight months ago, I've been able to predict some interesting developments, which I'll share with you in this video. I thought this situation was deeply related to the fact that the main characters of the manga One Piece are pirates. By the way, as this situation progresses, there is someone among the Straw Hat pirates whose dream will come true. If the world sinks into the sea, it will lead to the creation of all blue. By the way, the term moteru used in this scene means to be popular with the opposite sex, so this does not imply that Sanji has romantic feelings for Bonnie. When someone says they want to be popular with many girls, it doesn't mean they intend to be romantically involved with all of them. It simply means they desire popularity from the opposite sex. In the world of One Piece, if you want to be popular with the opposite sex, Thinking, I want to be popular, is probably a mistake in the first place. Jokes aside, I want to start by considering the mechanism by which the world is sinking, based on the information available in the manga so far. The biggest clue we have is that after Lulucia was destroyed by the Mother Flame, sea levels around the world rose by one meter. I've explained this with the supervision of a friend who's well-versed in earth sciences from a scientific perspective, but honestly, this part goes beyond mere entertainment, so I was hesitant about including it in the video. I'd be happy if even one person listens to it all the way through. Sengoku, Omei Sekai Seifu wa itsu ka kuru. More than 10 years have passed since the serialization of the Marineford arc. In the anime One Piece, Whitebeard left a lasting impression on viewers as a power user who could control earthquakes. Then, perhaps by some twist of fate, in 2011, a massive earthquake and tsunami struck Japan. The owner of this channel was a student in Japan at the time. I was at school, and even though I was far from the epicenter, the intense shaking lasted for several seconds. That's why I can truly understand firsthand. The world of One Piece is now in chaos. Oceans throughout the world of One Piece were struck by tsunamis and earthquakes, raising the sea level by one meter. It feels like the stage has been set where we can envision a situation where oceans across the world get embroiled in battle. I think there are a few individuals who might have foreseen this situation, and he is likely one of them. If we consider that the other members of the Roger Pirates also knew about the world sinking, their actions make consistent sense. Crocus can enjoy his retirement inside Laboon even if the world sinks. Rayleigh lives not on an island, but among the mangroves. Since he can swim from the Sabaody archipelago to the Calm Belt, he would likely survive even if the world were to sink. Moreover, I believe he became a coding craftsman, not just for its own sake, but to enable the rescue of people by boat in a world that is sinking. With that in mind, other members of the Roger Pirates might also be hiding, preparing for that day. I think they will appear when people all over the world are drawn into the battle. 
I think the current world of One Piece is being swept up in the the flow of time, one of its essential themes. However, we, the readers, are likely to have one burning question. Why, after a huge hole appeared in the ruins of Relucia, did earthquakes strike the world, leading to a rise in sea levels? Granted, it's a manga, so phenomena that can't be explained by the science of our world are bound to occur. Yet the scientific theories within the world of One Piece are often detailed in the manga itself. Hence, I anticipate that the causal relationship between this massive hole, the earthquakes, and the sea level rise will be explained at some point. Let's first consider the case of rising sea levels. In our world, sea levels are believed to rise due to the expansion of seawater as it warms and the melting of mountain glaciers, as well as ice sheets and glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland. Take the Arctic as an example. A crucial process is the melting of sea ice from below by warm seawater flowing in from the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. In reality, Pacific origin seawater entering from the Bering Strait is known to form a warm layer, akin to underfloor heating for sea ice, over the continental shelf and into the central Arctic Ocean. The situation in Antarctica is similar. Currently, the majority of sea level rise from the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet originates from the West Antarctic ice sheet facing the Amundsen Sea. Causes for this melting are reported from both oceanic and atmospheric sides. In essence, it's the melting caused by warmer seawater infiltrating near the ice sheet and the surface melting caused by the influx of warm air. So, a plausible explanation for the one-meter rise in sea levels across the world of One Piece could be the melting of the Arctic and Antarctic ice. The existence of the Arctic and Antarctic in the world of One Piece was indeed mentioned during a quarrel between Shanks and Buggy. In Mr. Oda's initial conception notebook, there's a page with a map of the world of One Piece, clearly marking the locations of the Arctic and Antarctic. What's interesting here is the presence of warmed seawater. How can this phenomenon be explained in the world of One Piece? Let's look at Cricket's explanation. The mechanism behind the knock-up stream's occurrence has been described. Due to geothermal activity, cold seawater gets heated, leading to the generation of immense vapor pressure. This results in a massive explosion within a vast underwater cavity, giving birth to the knock-up stream. This suggests that the blue planet where Luffy and his crew live likely has something akin to a mantle. Indeed, the Straw Hat crew's voyage to Fishman Island prominently showcased the existence of underwater volcanoes. So in the world of One Piece, there likely is a mantle-like presence beneath the sea, forming these underwater volcanoes. Everything comes together here. The vast hole created by the attack using the Mother Flame reached as deep as the part of the seabed that emits geothermal energy. This may have stimulated underwater volcanoes, causing magma to flow out. The seawater, continuously pouring into this hole, was heated by the geothermal energy, resulting in a rise in seawater temperature. But where does this heated seawater go? Frankie's explanation answers this question. Ocean currents constantly travel around the world. Therefore, the water falling into the hole reached the sediment layer heated by the seabed volcanoes and geothermal energy. Likely, this geothermally heated seawater was circulated around the world by these currents. Moreover, the simultaneous global earthquakes probably caused tsunamis. I think these tsunamis hastened the delivery of the warmed seawater to the poles, either the south or north. There, vast amounts of ice were warmed by the seawater, resulting in a theory that the global sea level rose by one meter. There's evidence supporting this theory. Consider the warm water vortex that appeared involving the infantilized Bonnie. Looking at Jinbei's explanation, somewhere a warm water mass is being pushed up. By the way, Luffy and the others encountered Bonnie a few days after the attack on Lulucia. 
This means that the seawater heated at the bottom of Lulusha's hole took a few days to reach the opposite side of the red line near Egghead. This warm water likely created the vortex. Now, it's time for some critical thinking. There's a question shared by one of my Patreon members. Even if the ice melts and sea levels rise, wouldn't the global sea level decrease if water keeps falling into this hole? Indeed, despite water continuously flowing into this massive hole, the global sea level rising by one meter seems strange. Understanding where the fallen water goes makes it clear. The water probably reaches the bottom of the hole made by the mother flame, hits the sediment layer, and then re-enters the global ocean circulation cycle. The sediment layer, continuously exposed to seawater for six days, might have cooled down, causing the sea level rise to halt at just one meter. Another question I received was, what's the relationship between the earthquake and the hole at the site of Lulucia? Six days after the mother flame attack, there was an earthquake in the world of One Piece. The cause of this earthquake might be related to a mechanism called trapdoor fault rupture induced by underwater volcanoes. The mother flame attack even shattered the seabed, allowing magma to flow into it. This magma flow exerts an upward force, causing fault lines to shift, thereby resulting in an earthquake. An important key to this theory's future might be the existence of the Arctic and Antarctic in the world of one piece. It probably means something that the scene where they argue about the Arctic and Antarctic is set in Water 7, which is sinking. Do you recall a country in the One Piece world that evokes the imagery of the poles? It's the land of ice, rumored to be where ores was found. According to Moria, Ors defeated a country 500 years ago and annexed the entire island into his territory, forming a nation of outlaws. This story gave birth to the legend of pulling a country. While Ors died at the age of 159, considering the lifespan of giants being 300 years, it is clear that Ors' parents' generation were the ancient giants who lived during the Void Century. I discussed in a previous video the theory that these giants were allies of the Great Kingdom because they still worship the Sun God. This is linked with the Shandians, who also believed in the Sun God and inherited the mission of protecting the Poneglyphs. Thus, it's highly plausible that the giants had a similar mission from the Great Kingdom. I explained in another video my theory that Loki, born a prince of Elbaf, might be guarding the last road poneglyph. Please watch if interested. Adding to this, considering no giants were part of the navy, an arm of the world government, until John Giant joined, it's likely that they, like the Great Kingdom, were adversaries of the world government. Now, let's consider why Shanks deepened his friendship with the giants. He, who had been insisting on the Antarctic, might have become interested in its opposite, the Arctic. Later, Shanks commented in Makino's bar, After two or three more voyages, I'm thinking of leaving this village and heading far north. Fusha Village is located in the northern part of East Blue. This likely means their destination was the Arctic. What was Shanks' objective in heading to the Arctic? It's plausible he went to investigate something about the history of the Great Kingdom. While the reason Ors was in the Land of Ice is yet to be disclosed, there's a possibility it had some connection with the Giants. Shanks also told Buggy he planned to take his time traveling the world, suggesting he was exploring places related to the Great Kingdom and the Void Century. I think the information about the ancient giant Ors, who died in the Land of Ice, was obtained from the Giants. Moria found Orr's corpse in a frozen country. Similarly, in cold regions like the Arctic and Antarctic, there are many frozen giants, and it's likely that Shanks encountered them there too. Shanks may have somehow saved the giants who were near death in this icy country, 
The giants worshipped the sun god, and Carmel used this belief to gain their trust. In fact, Shanks is at the heart of why the sun god Nika was revived. And like Mother Carmel, Shanks too can manipulate fire. As revealed in Film Red, his sword, Griffin, can catch fire. Thus, he might have also been able to melt a frozen giant. There are many such icy nations in the world of One Piece. I currently believe that attacks capable of altering the landscape of islands like Mother Flame could lead to global warming of the seas and pose a risk of sinking. Let's examine the contents of the letter from Lily that Cobra spoke about just before he was killed by Emu. We'll try to figure out some Japanese phrases that might fit in that part. The focus here is on this phrase. This expression is often used in poetry and story narration. Those who are knowledgeable about Japanese might know that this yuku is an archaic expression of the verb ikyu, meaning to go. And when yuku is used in an archaic manner, it is often connected to other verbs. When yuku is attached to a verb, it can express the state of becoming something. Let's look at some commonly used expressions in Japanese. A world falling apart, a sinking world, dying people. As you can see, this expression is often used in a negative context. So in this letter, what state of the world is Princess Lily urging the future kings of Alabasta to raise the flag of dawn in? Personally, I think inserting a sinking world here would make the sentence sound most natural to a native speaker. Moreover, after reading chapter 1089, this makes sense contextually. That's because the sea level around the world has indeed risen by one meter due to Emu's use of the mother flame. And many beaches around the world have disappeared, with some islands vanishing completely. Incidentally, the fact that Alabasta's royal palace stands on high ground may be because one of the previous kings who read Lily's letter was afraid of the world sinking. Alabasta is a desert country, where securing water is most vital for its people. Yet ironically, Lily foresaw a future where lives would be taken away by water. Let's delve deeper into the meaning of her letter. Firstly, regarding protect the poneglyphs. In chapter 1085, it was revealed by Emu that Lily had freed the poneglyphs. But how did she free them? In this video, I speculated that she might be an awakened user of the Bara Bara Nomi. This allowed her to disperse the connected poneglyphs and distribute them worldwide. Another devil fruit that might have been used to scatter the poneglyphs across the world could be the Nikyu Nikyu Nomi. I believe that its user was among Joy Boy's Nakama. This is because, given Kuma's actions so far, the destinations of the Nikyu Nikyu ability seem to be limited to places he has previously visited. When Kuma escaped from God Valley, he simply returned to his homeland. And to help Bonnie, he traveled from the Kamabaka Kingdom through Maria Joie to Egghead, both places he had visited before. The destinations where the Straw Hat crew was sent were also places Kuma had visited during his travels. From this, it is quite plausible that Lily became a pirate to distribute the Poneglyphs worldwide, relying on her crewmates' abilities. After her adventures with Luffy and the others, Vivi returned to Alabasta as a princess. In contrast, Lily might have left her position as a princess, to join Joy Boy and venture into the sea as pirates. But let's also analyze another phrase. Raise the flag of dawn in a sinking world. This flag of dawn likely represents a specific symbol. The national flag of Alabasta, which she governed, features a sun symbol. As you may know, groups bearing this dawn symbol exist in the world of One Piece. They are likely the ones Vegapunk refers to as those waiting for Nika. In this sinking world filled with despair, Nika might be seen as a savior. The fact that Lily left such a letter suggests that perhaps 800 years ago, 
the world also faced a crisis of sinking. Indeed, there are islands still affected by this hole. Yes, nearby Water 7 continues to sink due to the high tides known as Aqua Laguna. As Frankie says, the city you see now is built on the remnants of the ancient civilization. A long time ago, the lower part of the city, which is submerged today, was part of the same island, along with the higher area where the shipyards are located. The shipbuilders who created Pluton back then probably had the knowledge of the advanced technology of the Great Kingdom, which allowed them to create a warship capable of destroying an entire island. Next, consider the undersea ruins depicted in Jinbei's cover story. Jinbei found a poneglyph here. The people who lived here might have been protecting this poneglyph, like the people of Shandia. Then there's the Golden City, Chandra. At first glance, Chandra seems to have been a regular, unsinkable island. But do you remember where the ancient city is located? It was below the ground level of Jaya. Kargara, having trusted Noland, decided to reveal the City of Gold to him. At that time, they descended the stairs to reach the ancient city. It felt strange that a thriving city was located underground, but if this is also a result of the world sinking, it makes sense. Impel Down. It is located in the middle of the Calm Belt, and countless sea kings reside around it. It seems impossible to construct such a building underwater, so it is natural to think that a facility that was originally on the ground has sunk underwater. Given the sun-like mark on the upper part of Impel Down and the ancient text drawn on the wall, similar to what is seen on poneglyphs, it can be assumed that it was a facility related to the Great Kingdom. It's also probable that this is where Who's Who first heard about the legend of Nika. All the places that are sunk at the bottom of the sea are seemingly associated with the Great Kingdom or facility. When I often talk about this topic with my friends, some say that Wano Country has sunk into the sea like Impel Down. However, Wano Country is not actually submerged in the sea. After a wall was built for some reason, rainwater accumulated there, causing the old Wano Country to sink to the bottom of a lake. The reason for building this wall has not yet been disclosed, but I think the clue lies in the elevation above sea level. Let's compare the elevation of Wano Country before and after it was surrounded by the wall. It's clear that the water level has risen, so it's reasonable to assume that the wall was constructed to temporarily prevent flooding. Thus, it's likely correct to believe that an event causing a rise in the global sea level occurred 800 years ago. At this point, a theory comes to mind. The theory is that the world government is deliberately planning to submerge the world in a flood. The root reason for the royal families of the 20 kingdoms, which formed the world government, to ascend the Red Line might have been because they ultimately planned to cover the world with the sea. I think Lily, knowing this, may have betrayed the world government to stop their plan. But why would the world government want to sink the world in the sea? I think it's because they are trying to completely wipe out the countries associated with the great kingdom that they opposed. With the acquisition of Mother Flame, which is as powerful as the ancient weapons, isn't it possible that the world government is again advancing this plan? Incidentally, in chapter 1089, York made an uncertain promise to the five elders, offering them Mother Flame in exchange for her life, while also elevating herself to a celestial dragon. With the freedom to use Mother Flame attacks, the government could easily eliminate inconvenient nations. The earthquakes produced by these attacks, although their relevance is unclear, could possibly hasten the process of sinking the world into the sea. The flag of this world government might also be suggesting that it will bore a hole into the world. In any case, I believe there is definitely a connection between this massive hole and the rise in sea level. The giant hole in Eni's lobby is a prime example of this. That's because the sea level in the waters where Water 7 exists 
which is located nearby, continues to rise. The entire world of One Piece might have been sinking for 800 years, perhaps even longer. In fact, there's a structure in the world of One Piece that bolsters this theory. Some of you might have thought of this already. Tequila Wolf. The purpose of this construction is still unclear, but it has been explained that it's being carried out by Order of the Celestial Dragons since 700 years ago. If the goal of the world government is to sink the world into the ocean, it seems only natural to build a bridge in preparation for that time. Let's take another look at the flag of the world government. It's possible that the lines connecting the circles may hint at Tequila Wolf. In the current world of One Piece, at least two massive holes in the middle of the ocean have been confirmed. There might even be a giant hole found at the site of God Valley, by acquiring the Mother Flame, the world government might be able to sink the world to the bottom of the ocean as originally planned. That's probably why Peter said, the long battle is coming to an end. If the world government has such a plan, then Noah could have been built with a sinking world in mind, similar to Tequila Wolf. While the Fishmen can live underwater, their allies, possibly the D-Clan, cannot. The Ark might be intended to transport those who will fight for the Fishmen and join them in battle against the world government, fulfilling Joy Boy's promise to the Fishmen. In my earlier explanation, I mentioned that pirates can act freely without being bound by their position, which is why Roger created the Great Pirate Era. This could also imply that in a world sinking into the sea, pirates who can fight on the sea will play a role in changing the world. In fact, Luffy, who cannot swim, says this, the sea is for pirates to handle. From this, we can see that Oda Sensei's statement just before the final chapter began, saying, this is where the real One Piece starts, was not an exaggeration. This is because so far, the main stages for Luffy and his crew's battles have been on islands, not on the sea. If I were Oda Sensei, I would definitely make the final chapter of a pirate manga feature the protagonist battling on the sea, true to the pirate spirit. According to Dawn Dusk's predictions, a naval battle like the one between Roger and Shiki during the Ed War might occur. One Piece began with Roger's execution and the dawn of the pirate era, but Roger's goal, as Usopp speculated, was likely to intentionally create the pirate era. And the reason he started the pirate era was because he learned of Joy Boy's wish. Joy Boy, the man who left a vast treasure on the last island, also created a system where one must gather four road poneglyphs, which Lily had freed to reach the final island. This was probably because he anticipated that the world would sink into the sea 800 years after the void century. This task could only be undertaken by pirates. Even if bandits carried on the will of D, if the mountains sank into the sea, they would struggle to save their own lives let alone change the world. Only pirates who can battle on the sea have the potential to change the world. Thus, I believe Joy Boy ingeniously used the pirate's instinct to bring back treasure by placing the treasure on Laugh Tail, thereby ensuring that pirates would discover the historical poneglyphs. And somehow, Toki, who traveled forward in time from 800 years ago, seemed to know when a surge of formidable pirates would descend upon the world. Odin said to Toki, Toki, didn't you also come in search of it, the day the world turns upside down? Then leap forward 20 years to what you desire. Mu. In the original version, the katakana for Mu suggests that Odin was about to say something starting with Mu, Mu is a personal pronoun for Emu, so does this mean he was suggesting she should meet Emu? No. 
I believe what he intended to say was, then leap forward 20 years to what you desire. The man in the straw hat. Toki probably got really angry and skipped making dinner for Odin, not just because she was told to go to the future alone, but also because she was told to meet another man wearing a straw hat. Toki surely did not wish for Odin to say such things. For as Toki, a woman on her own journey, there was no destination but Odin, the man she was destined to follow. She was originally from Wano country, but she wasn't there 800 years ago. This means it's likely that her parents also went to sea as pirates. Probably, people at that time were forced to make such decisions. <laughs>